the greatest natural and national curiosity in the world. Joyce Het was supposedly 161 years of age when purchased by P.T. Burnham. She had papers to prove it. The proof was a very yellowing bill of sale from Augustine Washington to Elizabeth Atwood. It stated, one Negro woman named Joyce Heth at age 54, four in consideration of the sum of 33 pounds lawful money of Virginia. The document was dated for February 5, 1727, and was witnessed by William Washington and Richard Beckner. Joyce Heth was Burnham's first attraction. He rented out Niblo's garden, and she went on display for all to see. She answered questions and told tales of being a caretaker for George Washington himself. He was advertised everywhere, and people came in crowds to witness this miracle. When the crowds began to die down, Burnham knew how to manipulate the masses in order to make a few bucks. He stated that Joyce Hett was a robot, and people came far and wide to witness this, or to see if she was really 161 years old. In the end, Het died, and a public autopsy revealed that she was only in her 80s. The hoax was, was very publicly revealed, and Burnham stayed afloat by claiming that he fell victim to the trickery himself. Wait, but who was this guy to purchase another human being to put on display? Born Phineas Taylor Burnham on July 5, 1810 in Bethel, Connecticut, he always regretted not being born on the 4th of July. He grew up in an average family. His family owned a farm and then a store in which Phineas was put in charge. He grew an instant love for business and bartering. Phineas grew up around a jokester, his grandfather, from whom he received his name. Burnham gained his hoax skills at an early age. His grandfather was the biggest humbug of all. Taylor, the grandfather, Deeded Burnham land at age four. The land was called Ivy Island. This entire family spoke about how wealthy and successful Burnham would be with this new land. Burnham thought about mines of silver and gold and rich fertile soil and land of milk and honey. After hearing about how great the land was for years, he continually begged to see it. Around age 10, his father caved and finally decided to take him to the island. Burnham was so excited he couldn't sleep for days. After a big journey, Burnham arrived in Ivy Island. It was a swampland. He felt so humiliated as his, his father and grandfather roared with laughter. He realized that he had been duped for years. Well, Burnham got the last laugh when he sold the island in order to pay his debt later in that career. Burnham doesn't fit the typical celebrity look. At six foot two, with curly receding hair, blue eyes, cleft chin, and a high-pitched voice, he seemed to perfectly fit the part of the oddities that he showcased. Burnham's career was that of a showman. He traveled wide and showcased his oddities for the world to see. Burnham started to make a name for himself after Joyce Hett, and continued to rise with fame with every subsequent attraction that followed. Burnham was not really a celebrity. His name was always advertised along with his attractions, but always in smaller print. People traveled far to see his attractions, not him. He seemed he was very successful at manipulating the masses in order to get them to pay to see his attractions, which makes him a great businessman and entrepreneur, but not a celebrity. Dong, Jen, and other researchers discovered that there is a positive correlation between celebrity advertisements and product success. As celebrities advertise with certain brands, their fans are more likely to buy into that brand over others. Burnham advertised specific attractions, but people bought into them for the attraction itself, not really because Burnham's name was attached. Other people were showcasing oddities too like Johan Nepomuk Mazel. Mazel supposedly created an automated chess machine, which was later discovered to be a tiny person shoved in a box. But people went to both attractions just to see the entertainment itself, not to see the showman. We'll revisit this theory later with Jumbo the Elephant. Burnham purchased and reopened the American Museum on January 1st, 1842.
Burnham invested much time and energy in this establishment in order to create stability. He was still a showman and now had a place to show off his oddities. One of his oddities was a man named Robert Hales, who was supposedly 7 foot 6 and weighed 462 pounds. Burnham continued to hire many other giants in order to display them. Burnham constantly sought new and exciting things to display. One day in 1842, Moses Kimball, a friend of Burnham, bought a mermaid. This mermaid was discovered off a ship off the coast of Boston. It had a face of a human, but a scaly thin body of a fish. The head was the size of a baboon, thinly covered in little black hairs. The head was turned and the face seemed to be stuck with an expression of terror. This tiny little monster was only three feet in length. Burnham took it to a naturalist, which reported no signs of a hoax. Burnham, excited to show off his discovery, wrote articles for newspapers and had woodcuts made in order to properly advertise. It was named Fiji Mermaid. Thousands attended Concert Hall at the admission price of only 25 cents. Fiji Mermaid was so widely publicized that the American Museum became a national institution and Burnham became America's first showman. Hold it. Of course this was a hoax, right? A real mermaid? Of course it was a hoax. Three decades after the reveal of Fiji Barnum admitted that it was a hoax. It was a monkey and a fish sewn together, and it was believed to have been constructed by a Japanese fisherman so neatly as to defy ordinary inspection. Oh darn, just when I was starting to believe there was hope. After Fiji, Barnum needed something new. Derailed travel plans led him directly to his next star, Charles S. Stratton, also known as General Tom Thumb. Charles was a little person. He was only 25 inches in height and weighed 15 pounds when Burnham discovered him. The Stratton family was very poor, and they agreed to have their son publicly displayed for only $3 a week. Burnham created the name from the legend of the original Sir Tom Thumb, one of King Arthur's knights, who could ride in on a roach through a one-inch wide door to the palace. Burnham decided that Tom Thumb needed something else, and added the title of General, because it was irresistible and added pizzazz. General Tom Thumb dressed the part, and he performed jokes and stories for his audience. Burnham made sure of his success with constant advertisements in the papers. He was a huge success for Burnham in America and in Europe. He even met Abraham Lincoln and performed for Queen Victoria. After his tour of Europe with Tom Thumb, Burnham kept the museum afloat with new and exciting attractions. He still hired giants and even married two giants within the museum. He hosted bearded lady competitions, and of course, Tom Thumb was around to do stand-up and impersonation. As we can see, Burnham was not a star of his museums or shows. I mentioned that Burnham was not a celebrity, but a showman. But he does counter a celebrity media culture theory. The gaze is the idea that visual arts and media depict the world through a masculine viewpoint, presenting women as objects for male pleasure. Burnham changed this gaze with his performances. Women were not objectified, but odd people and those with disabilities were. Women are belittled and seen as less than human in the male gaze, and odd, deformed, and disabled people are seen as less than human and even monstrous through the Burnham gaze. Now let's turn the gaze toward Chang and Ang. Chang and Ang were Siamese twins. This term became so engrossed in the English language that it was added to the Webster's Dictionary. Chang and Ang were actually Chinese, born in a small village near Bangkok. From birth, they were united by a thick, fleshy ligament connecting their lower chest. Chang and Ang did not get along too well. Chang drank heavily, and Ang didn't care for it. Chang enjoyed wine and women, 
and Aang was more studious and enjoyed a good game of chess. After being displayed by Hunter and Burnham, there was much talk about whether they were actually conjoined or not. They got married to twins and even had a double wedding. After show business ended, Chang and Aang managed to have at least 20 children. After their death, it was determined that they were in fact conjoined and could not have lived apart, though they had wished to. On September 15, 1885, one of the world's most loved celebrities died in a tragic accident. This celebrity wasn't a king, actor, or singer. It wasn't Phineas himself. It was a six-ton giant African elephant named Jumbo. He was a star in one of the world's first modern zoos, the London Zoological Gardens. Jumbo was loved and visited by many people in England. Queen Victoria often visited, bringing sweet rolls as a treat for Jumbo. Jumbo was eventually purchased by P.T. Burnham, which caused much outrage in England, as Jumbo was their beloved creature. Burnham made Jumbo into a huge star, traveling around the country in order to show him off. Jumbo was very popular. His name and picture were in newspapers and magazines and even on merchandise such as soap. Jumbo was such a curiosity because most people had never seen something so large and exotic. People were exposed to dead exotic animals, but the spectacle of a live one was great. Jumbo was a celebrity. His name was well known, he was visible in papers and magazines, and he was used for advertisement for brands, which fits the previous celebrity theory that companies use celebrity status in order to achieve success with products. Because Jumbo was so popular, his fans purchased the merchandise with his picture on it over others. Jumbo was a real celebrity out of all of Burnham's attractions. Jumbo died because he was struck by a train. His skeleton is in the American Museum of Natural History. After his death, his image lived on. In 1935, a Broadway musical was based off of Jumbo's life, and a movie was created after that in 1962. In order to conclude this segment on P.T. Burnham, we must agree that he was not a celebrity in his time. He was solely the man behind the curtain that reaped the benefits of his discovered oddities. He worked hard. He wrote pamphlets and articles and devoted his time to the success of his shows. He even ran in a few government offices. In today's world, he is an icon. Because of him, we have an appreciation for the stranger things in this world. He created a form of entertainment that satisfies curiosities to this day. Not only do we remember him, we as a society remember his great hoaxes. Some people may say that he exploited people with disabilities and his audience members. He would say that there is a sucker born every day, and I say that he was a great, fabulous showman. give my parting thanks to the British public and to assure them that I shall ever gratefully cherish both pleasant memories of their kindness and hospitality, even higher than the deteriorating success with which they have caused my efforts to please them. I thus address the world through the medium of the latest wonderful invention, Edison Portable, so that my voice, like my great show will reach future generations and be heard centuries after I have joined the great and as I believe in the happy majority.